the lady's saying. All right, welcome, folks, to our CCNA Cyber Ops meeting for the uh, 5th of July. Uh, like I said, happy uh, Canada Day and July 4th, and all that for this week. I'm glad to have, we got a, a pretty good group to have uh, for the holiday week, so I'm glad to have everyone here. Uh, if you want to, you can mute yourself and then you can come off mute when you uh, want to ask questions. What I'm going to do today is I'm jumping ahead because as we discussed with five, chapters um, 4, 5, and 6, you pretty much know that material. Uh, if there are any questions on it, feel free to let me know and we will do everything we can or I will do everything I can to get you through it. But I'm going to actually jump ahead to uh, chapter 7 and we're going to talk a little bit more about network attacks. And I want to run through a couple things on NetLabs just to show you some items that can trip people up when they're using NetLabs. And again, remember that's optional. If you have the equipment working at your site and you've got the VMs at your site and you want to use your own VMs, then you are by all means encouraged uh, to do that and to continue to do that. And uh, let me pull out everybody here so I can see the chat and everything, make sure I've got everything ready here. Um, it's kind of funny because I've got two monitors in my office, and I have a very big 34-inch uh, curved monitor in one section. And over on the other section, I actually have, so this is my big curved monitor, and over here is the monitor. I had to put a little 24-inch monitor, which, quote, little. Who would have thought that when we first started working on computers? A little 24-inch monitor over here because WebEx didn't like to do uh, the curved monitor. But that is what it is. We're going to look at some of the different things that go into looking at a network attack, and we're going to look at really a lot of different things. The first thing we want to talk about is we want to talk about network monitoring, and we're going to look at how you do that with, especially this day and age, with our networks that are completely um, switched. In other words, if we have a network that is totally switched, everything is on its own switch port, you have some difficulties with monitoring traffic. Now, there's one way you can do it. One is this tap. You can put a network tap, which honestly is basically an old bridge. If you remember what a bridge or a repeater is, you know, in most respects, uh, it's just a physical layer device that passively grabs information, makes a copy of it, and then sends it out to a monitoring device. You notice here that this is a network tap that is internal, I mean, excuse me, external um, between the firewall and the internal router. Most people would say you'd also need a network tap between the internal router and the internal networks. And then you get all kind of problems when we look at our modern networks and we start looking at how do you monitor east-west traffic in a data center. Now, what is east-west traffic? East-west traffic is traffic between VMs on the back plane of a virtualized switch. So east-west traffic, to monitor it, you've got to put a device virtualized into your environment that can actually look at the traffic. There are ways to do that, but again, then you're looking at how do I, how much latency am I going to place into my network. A network tap really shouldn't produce any latency because it is pretty much, again, just a repeater. But once you start putting firewalls in to look at east-west traffic and then looking at north-south traffic, and that's traffic that's leaving the virtualized server or virtualized environment, and going out to the network and back. So um, a great example would be this. If you had two domain controllers and they both were virtual machines, they're both virtualized servers, they're both sitting on ESXi, or for your classes, one way you can describe it, is imagine you had two machines in VirtualBox that are both on the same virtual network, and they send information between one another. In other words, it stayed inside of VirtualBox. That's east-west traffic. If, however, one of those machines or one of those Active Directory machines in an ESXi environment wanted to send information out to another server that was on another physical box, then that would be north-south traffic. So, again, interesting problems we have when we try to look at uh, determining our networks and looking at the traffic in our networks. Cisco has a... Um, solution is called SPAN or Switch Port Analyzer, and SPAN ports can be a port that is, with, there's two different types, there's the source port and destination ports. Now you can take multiple source ports and point them to a single destination point, uh, destination port. The problem there is you have to be very careful because you don't want to overwhelm the destination SPAN port. So if it's uh, two fast Ethernet ports going to a gig, as this example shows, that's fine, but if you had 
you know, two gig ports going to one gig port, you could possibly overwhelm that gig port. Or 10 gig ports going to one gig port, that could possibly overwhelm it. Probably wouldn't, but possibly could, so you have to be careful there. And then we look at ingress and egress traffic, and ingress is traffic that is going into the device, egress is traffic exiting the device, okay? We do also have what's called R span or remote span, and we can do that. Basically, you can put a make a span port across a set of trunks and have that information sent to a span port on a different switch. Remote span is good because it lets you monitor those remote switches. Any questions on span? This has been in. Golly, I'm trying to think. I don't think this is in CCNA anymore. Is it? Yeah, it is. I think it is in. I'm drawing a blank. I'm, I'm even teaching. I just taught connecting, but I can't remember for life of me if it's in connecting or if it's in CCNA security. I think it's in CCNA security. If anybody knows, help me out. I know I've seen it on CCNP switch, but that's the only place I've seen it, I think. So it's something you probably need to cover with your students. Now, what about protocol analyzers? Uh, security uh, information event management and the uh, management systems and NetFlow. We're going to go over those three. We're going to start out first with Wireshark, which used to be Ethereal, but it is now Wireshark. Okay. It is a protocol analyzer. And one of the things I like to show people, and I think I may have shown, I always forget, but here's something that's kind of good Wireshark University, wiresharktraining.com. You can go here and get all kind of information about. Uh, Shark Fest, so they actually have a, a Shark Fest, um, different topics, course pricing. Um, basically, you see that's actually really not bad. You get thousand dollars, and it gives you a full one-year all-access pass to training. Um, man, pretty nice place too. Pretty nice hotel. Um, but this is cool. At the home here, they've got. Um, you can actually look at a one-hour seminar with Lars Hotel. And uh, Gerald Combs, the creator of Wireshark. And you also can grab the trace file so you can actually follow along with what they're doing here. I also, uh, one of the things I bought is I bought this book, uh, Wireshark 101, second edition. Ah, CCNA Security. Thank you, Robert. Uh, so, yes, uh, SPAN is in CCNA Security. I knew, like I said, I teach so many classes, I get confused as to, um, as to why. I, I, like I said, I, my excuse is HIBAC. Hit by a truck. You know, that's 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 my excuse. Hit by, hit by a truck. I'm not getting older. I just got hit by a truck. But um, this is a good book. This uh, Wireshark 101. I know several schools that are actually using this book to learn uh, to uh, learn Wireshark in one of their uh, security analysis classes. Are any of you using uh, one of these books or using Wireshark? I know. I don't think Harry's on tonight. Harry Bulbert. I don't think Harry is on, but I think he has used it before. Kendra, I think you've seen it too. But after I saw it at one of our uh, one of our conferences, I actually bought it off of Amazon for myself. But this Wireshark University is neat, so you can learn a great deal about Wireshark if you want to. And it is a good thing because it is a tool that almost everyone does use, especially when you're trying to look at PCAPs or even taking uh, another well-known utility, which is TCP dump. You can actually use TCP dump to dump uh, information and then pull that into Wireshark and analyze it using uh, Wireshark. And then there is a T T Shark, which is a Wireshark command line tool, similar to TCP dump, and then Wind dump, which is a variant of TCP dump. I use mainly Wireshark. I won't and pretend in any way, shape, or form to be a Wireshark um, expert, but I can get my way around it, and I know enough to. Uh, uh, to be to be dangerous, I guess you could say. So we have our analyzers. Now there are others, folks. This is just two of the ones we cover here, and we definitely cover these two because they are pretty much open source and free. Um, NetFlow is a Cisco IOS technology that has actually been expanded to other non-Cisco platforms, and it is designed to look at IP flows. So it's going to look at uh, connections between multiple devices, and then that. Um, that connection information is sent to a NetFlow collector, and then that can be analyzed. Now, the one mentioned here is Cisco StealthWatch, and we will hear much more about that in our next chapter. It's actually in chapter, yep, next chapter, chapter eight. 
but it can do things like flow stitching, put individual flows together, flow de deduplication, which means it can take duplicate flows and um, filter them. It can take NAT stitching, which takes uh, can use the simplified flows with NAT because things do get a little weird with NAT when you have a flow going on because technically you're changing, obviously, the source and destination IP addresses. So that's uh, one of the things. They also have here a short video on Stealth Watch. I would suggest you do have your students watch all these videos because when Cisco goes to ask questions about items on the test, some of it will be information about this. Here's also a neat thing. This is a cool Stealth Watch uh, talk that the guy does a little, a little talk and talks about. So, and I want one of these boards really badly, but you know, we got to build one. We'll talk more about NetFlow as we move on because we're going to talk about the five tuples of NetFlow in a little bit. Other items, security information, event management. Now, these are designed to take information from protocol analyzers, information from NetFlow, information from other devices like your intrusion detections, your next generation firewalls, take all that information in and then help you make decisions about whether or not an attack is occurring, um, correlate different pieces of information. In other words, pull in a, a Wireshark capture that is the same thing that you would see or that can occur when you see an IDS event fire. And so in other words, you can take those two and correlate that at that time and an event, security event was taking place and you can use those two to help determine A, what's going on and B, what your next step should be. Um, the security uh, information event management also does aggregation. So it takes all this volume of data and tries to make it um, more usable, tries to, to remove duplicate events. It tries to give you some reporting and in information. Um, you know, depending on how it's set up, you can get everything from uh, the time of the expected attack, the source and destination IP addresses, usernames, OSs, MAC addresses. It just depends on uh, you know how you you set your network up. You maybe you might be able to tell. Do you have a fully patched operating system that was attacked? Was it an iPad attack? Was attacked? Was it um, you know Windows device, etc. So it's this these types of uh, of systems many times are fairly expensive. Um, there's several out here that we talk about, which is one is Splunk, and Splunk used to be free. Now it's more of a pay-for thing. Um, we've got Elasticsearch and ELK Suite, Logistack, and Kibana, so that's three of them there. And we're going to use one down the road um, that in our security onion that we're going to use that we'll, we'll throw in there. But it's there are different systems now. The good news is this class does teach you how to use um, a system somewhat, and then at least your students will be familiar with the basic process of how to use one of these systems. Now, there's a great deal of information out here on Splunk. So you can go out here and look at it and do whatever you want. So it's pretty neat. I'm going to skip that. Uh, Patrick Tracer skip that. Uh, now, this is where they jump in the IPv4 and v6. And this is stuff you all know. Uh, I do think it's neat to look at the header for IPv4 and then look at the header for IPv6 and look how much simpler the IPv6 header is. So that even though the header or the IP addresses are much bigger, um, the belief and the feel is that IPv6 can be and is much faster than IPv4 because you don't have to parse all these pieces of a complicated header. And that's the whole design and, and idea behind this. Um, IP vulnerabilities, we, I'm not going to spend a great deal of time on these, but the ICMP attacks, uh, you know, ping of death, denial of services, uh, address spoofing, we're going to just jump through these here, but here's an ICMP flood. So basically your, your uh, IP, uh, ICMP echo request spoof to a victim, and then they reply, and so you can cause a flood uh, back to the spoofed victim. Okay. Now, this is why most places turn off ICMP at the edge. So in other words, if you tried to ping uh, outside of your network, it's, there's a good chance it's not going to work. I know it won't work here. I can ping inside, but I can't ping outside. 
So um, that's something that's pretty common. Now there's, uh, I think, the actual documents, internet documents, asks that you leave on, uh, was it ICMP Unreachable? And I believe ICMP, I think that's it. I think it's ICMP Unreachable is what they want you to leave left on. But honestly, most people just turn all ICMP at the edge off. Other types of ICMP that we deal with now, there's ICMP Router Discovery. Um, that can be used to, to inject bogus route entries. But also you gotta be careful because you do have ICMP, remember, router uh, advertisements and router uh, solicitations for ICMP version six. So it's, it's internally, it's very hard to turn off ICMP completely. Denial of service attacks, malformed packets. This used to be a common denial of service. You do a teardrop or you take a, an Xmas, you'd create a packet that had all the uh, different tags for TCP turned on, uh, different flags, excuse me, turned on and send it and then it could cause something to crash. Um, to, for the most part, Echo reply, okay, there you go. Robert's got it. it said, several IC are recommended for proper network. They should be allowed into the internal network. Echo reply, source quench unreachable, okay. Yeah, but even though, I will say this, Robert, that, that is what's recommended, but you, uh, there are very few, there are very few places that actually allow that. So, we, uh, we don't. I know for a fact we can't ping out. Um, and most of the networks I've ever worked on do not allow uh, the ability to ping out. Quick show of hands here. This will be a good, good little thing here. Yes, yeah, CSA security is old. Um, quick show of hands. Raise your hand if you cannot ping outside of your local network at your at your school or your job in case you're, you don't work at a school. So everybody kind of throw your hands up. So, so far, five, four of you cannot ping outside. And I can't, I know I can't, that's five. That's fewer than I thought. I been figured it'd be more of us. Okay. Greg cannot, okay. That's interesting, yeah. We, uh, I know most of the places I've worked and most of the places that ping using UDP. Now that's funny, okay? That is funny. Other DDoS attacks, uh, overwhelming quantity of traffic, that's almost impossible to stop, folks. Um, there's an amplification attack. So you put ICMP echo uh, request for the source victim's IP, and then the victim gets hammered by that. So you can also do this if they happen to have, cyber criminal happens to have a, a botnet, they can do something like this and then have it come from, from a botnet. And then suddenly you've got all this traffic coming in from multiple sources, and that is almost impossible to stop. Even worse, really, a DDoS attack is not just a zombie, which is I mean, it's possible, that's obviously something that can happen, but if you're doing a, a SIN flood, uh, because SIN floods are hard to mitigate, however, most routers will now mitigate most firewalls too. We'll try to mitigate SIN floods as much as possible. Uh, address spoofing attacks, I mean, again, this is straight out of C uh, Security Plus, but looking at uh, spoofing MAC addresses, uh, you could try to use it to spoof to, to make traffic go across a port. Uh, blind spot, you basically not being able to see the target or being able to see it, uh, depends on whether or not you can actually uh, affect and see the, the traffic. And one way you can do that is you overwhelm the MAC address table, and then you can see all of the MAC addresses that are available on a particular switch by having it uh, broadcast that out. Uh, let's see, TCP, wonderful little protocol, except for one problem. And here's our six different flags. The problem with it is because it is reliable delivery and it does have flow control, it requires you to have a three-way handshake. That three-way handshake, SIN, SYNAC, and ACT, makes it susceptible to SIN floods. In other words, if I can send millions of SINs to your device and they send a SIN act, they then have what's called a half open connection. They're waiting for this act. Now there's ways to mitigate this. One is today's modern firewalls many times will automatically just send an act in place of the external host so that the host can, the, the receiving host 
here can close that half open connection and go ahead and establish the connection. If, however, that is not implemented, then you can actually do a send flood and the web server will wait and wait and wait. And as long as it has open, too many half open connections, it won't accept any more connections. And so you can use, and hackers have learned to do this, they use the very methods of the protocol themselves to cause problems in a network. Again, this is something that's been mitigated uh, in some respects by doing uh, our routers and next generation firewalls sending an ACK once uh, the SYN ACK is sent back out. They'll ACK for the external host. Then what will happen is if there are no, there's no response, it will eventually terminate the session. And this is what can you hear, FIN, ACK, SYN FIN, and then ACK. There's also a way to reset, which is when you drop a connection for TCP. Without the FIN, it just drops and it drops. I, the, I tell my students that when you drop a TCP connection by reset, using the reset, it's basically like uh, breaking up with somebody over text. Whereas if you do it with the fin bit, it's like doing it in person. That usually gets their attention. UDP attacks, uh, there are some, obviously. Uh, I guess you can ping using UDP, even though it's blocked on your network. Um, there's some different things that can do uh, attacks, flood attack using UDP. The only thing about that is uh, UDP doesn't have half open connections. So it doesn't have as much of a problem um, with the technology, you just have to send a large amount of UDP packets. And since most routers and firewalls allow UDP, that can cause a um, denial of service. Now, again, that just depends on how the firewall is set up, because the firewall will probably only permit traffic that originates inside going out um, or shouldn't. So it is what it is there. ARP. Now, folks, I spend a lot of time talking about ARP in my Season A1 class. ARP is a protocol that finds the uh, MAC address from a known IP address. ARP request goes out in a broadcast, and then ARP reply comes back from everyone who sees it, and you will get a reply from the correct host if it is able to see it. One way you could uh, create a problem here is you could poison the ARP cache either on an individual PC, which I would do that um, by just uh, messing with the, the local ARP cache. Or you can um, also do a denial of service on the router and have your hacking machine respond to the MAC address of the default gateway. And then the client will come to you instead of the default gateway. And then you send it to the default gateway and you're now a man in the middle attack or person in the middle. Most of this is all stuff you've seen before. Now, this was something I hadn't seen. Um, and I, it's just, I, I know DNS and I know how rapidly insecure DNS is. I know it's a bad use of a word, but still it is. It's very insecure. Um, it's getting better, but it's still pretty bad. Um, one of the things that we have to look at is if you can falsify a DNS cache or you can falsify or, or corrupt DNS um, databases, you can send someone to um, velonews.com. They think they're sitting on velonews.com. They'll try to log in and it won't work. And it looks exactly like what we expect. Now, that's somewhat hard to do because when I go to a site that has, um, that is secured, now this is not secured, okay? So this one you could possibly um, effect. But if I go to a secure site, let's see if I can get this secure. Okay, now this is secure. So even if I was able to corrupt the database, by the way, I play miniatures games, so sorry. But even if you are, were able to corrupt the database and send me to a bogus games workshop site, it would be very difficult for to fake this right here. And when you go into the details and you can see who it was, the subjects games workshop, if you looked, it would be very, very, very difficult to do to fake this. In fact, you probably wouldn't. You'd probably end up with something. That's right, Robert. Who doesn't like miniatures? You'd probably end up with something that was not secure. And so if people were looking, they would know. 
okay? So that's one of the things about DNS that's good is it's, it's hard to, to, really hard to fake this. If you were going to an insecure site and you happen to, like I said, Valor News is not secure, I had weird hobbies. I know I'm a cyclist and a, and a miniature painter and a, and a hunter, so weird things here. But if if you're looking at these different items here, if it's not secure, it would be very easy if I started putting anything in to be have someone steal my credentials. So and then again, we should never stick anything in on any site that we don't have um, a secure set of credentials. So. DNS, uh, DNS resource utilizations. Uh, a couple years ago, the DNS servers on the east coast of the United States went down, and that pretty much stopped all traffic. You know, if you can't put in www.baylornews.com, I have no idea what the, the IP addresses are for those. Because remember, DNS is resolving IP addresses from host names. So if you can take down the DNS servers, you can pretty much take out the internet. And Believe it or not, I think it was at that point when that occurred on the East Coast that, and not too many years ago, there were only eight root sets of DNS servers. And four, I think four of them were taken offline, three or four were taken offline in a DOS attack. And after that, they quietly brought up, I think, another five or six throughout, um, you know, throughout the world so they could be, they could replicate root servers. Um, so they realize how big a deal that is. There's also now secure DNS, so they're working on some things to make DNS more secure. There's also, uh, once you, if you do have uh, malware trying to use DNS, then you've got, you can have this, which is fast flux, which is, means they're quickly changing network of compromised DNS hosts. The IP addresses are constantly moving within minutes. And so botnets use that to hide uh, their malicious activity makes them very troublesome and hard to track down. Um, threat actors use rapidly changing host names to IP to change authoritative name servers. And then you can even use what are called domain generation algorithms, where you just constantly generate new domains that are used for CNC servers for um, the malware. And then the malware knows where to go look for those uh, CNC servers. Because what happened was um, many of the bigger malware attacks were being stopped because they would go into the code and find out that the malware needed a certain uh, DNS uh, entry for, to find their CNC server, and so they would just block that at the at the firewall, and then those basically stopped the malware, stopped the botnet. Well, the bad the bad guys got smart to that and started saying, well, guess what? We'll set it up to where we go look at X amount of time for different names. This is something I have to admit I knew absolutely nothing about until this class. Um, now, I've hidden stuff in pings before. In other words, I've used um, a hex editor to, to put a message in hex and then put that hex as part of the, or actually as the payload for an H ping, sent that to somebody who captured it with Wireshark, and then they got the message. Um, so I've done that before, so I've tunneled things inside a ping, which is pretty cool. But the idea of tunneling traffic inside of DNS, the reason this is so ingenious is that for the most part, you have to allow DNS traffic. And by using DNS tunneling, they, they take basic DNS traffic and put non-DNS traffic inside of it. So they tunnel or put information into encoded chunks. And once it's uh, received by the bot, the bot can decode it. So it's, it's ingenious. It looks like normal DNS traffic unless you drill all the way down into it. And so unless you do a very deep dive on it with some type of next generation firewall, you're not gonna see this attack. You could possibly see this attack too if you see a huge increase in DNS traffic. Um, but the most, for the most part, you're gonna have to look at uh, what's in the traffic itself. And there are several things that can do that. Uh, and you know, here's another thing they talk about DNS. Cisco's open DNS will block much of the DNS traffic because it uh, identifies suspicious domains. Yep. Oh, cool. That is good. It says, I'm sorry I wrote so much. Man, I'm catching up. Uh, Robert's saying, tunneling traffic in DNS also works well where there are Wi Fi access points 
Most Wi-Fi access points in airports will provide will allow DNS. Oh wow, cool! So you can bypass the portal page. <laughs> I got, I got to, I got to try that. Yeah, that'd be that'd be good. Got to find me some stuff to do it. Now I figure it would be very slow, but pretty neat though. Pretty neat. It's just like I said. It's uh, this is always a a battle. Because you're seeing people, they're using the technology that are that's required on a network to expand their ability to compromise a network. Now, one thing I will tell you here is I'm going to teach you a very simple thing, and this is something I teach all of my students. And you are welcome to use this if you, if you want. The DHCP is the realm of Aunt Dora. Good old Aunt Dora is that aunt that sits around and asks you. Why you don't have kids yet, you know, uh, or why you're not married, or yeah, you're looking fat at the, at the family reunion. But good old Aunt Dora, DHCP Discover, which is what we have there, DHCP Offer, DHCP Request, and DHCP Acknowledgement. Now. Here's what I tell my students, DHCP Discover, which is by the client. Hey, are there any DHCP servers out there? And the first one to see it, the server, will say, yep, here's, here I am, and uh, here's an IP address that you could use. The client then says, well, that's a mighty fine looking IP address you've got, so if you don't mind, can I use it? And then the server will give an acknowledgement and say, sure, go ahead and use it. At that point, the client binds it to their uh, teach IP stack, and they have an IP address. Notice there are also some other items that are associated with this, and these are our DHCP, DHCP options. Um, 003, which is router or gateway. 006, which is uh, DNS, I believe. Uh, 044, which is WINS, and 046, which is NetBios name. So nobody said C2 anymore. The reason I put these down is because one time I was actually interviewing with uh, Microsoft for a job, and they said, well, you know about DHCP? And I said, well, you know, it's hands out IP addresses and scopes, et cetera, et cetera, options 003, 006, 044, and 046. And they were like, okie dokie. But most of the time we don't set these two anymore because we don't use them, but we do set these. Uh, and we may set some other options depending upon whether, whether or not we're using uh, IP phones, uh, like the TFTP server uh, option that can be set. And I'll tell you something else. I know we teach students in our classes to use uh, Cisco routers as DHCP servers. Unless it's just a really small remote network, almost everybody's going to run it on, on Windows or on uh, Linux because it's just so much easier to manage than it is on a, on a, on a, on a, a Cisco device. So there's my little Aunt Dora that helps you. You can remember DHCP with. Now what can, uh, what can folks do to make DHCP a problem? Well, they can, one thing, they can use up all the IP addresses. So if you could somehow fake 200 MAC addresses and use all the DHCP addresses, well, you got a problem. Uh, sorry, wrong thing. Rogue DHCP. Now, one thing you're going to learn is there is a way to do uh, DHCP snooping, and it is definitely covered in uh, CSNA security and also covered in CSNA's CSNP switch. But with DHCP snooping, you can determine what ports you allow DHCP uh, offers to come in from, and then if any offers are found on a different port, that port can be shut down or it can be blocked. So you can actually effectively block rogue DHCP servers. There's actually a Windows function now, and I am way, way out of my league here because it's been a long time since I did this. But there used to be a way that in a domain environment you had to activate or authenticate your DHCP servers. And any non-authenticated or activated, I think it's actually called activated, non any non-activated DHCP servers on the network would be automatically shut down if they were Windows, rogue Windows DHCP servers. 
Um, if you're a Windows guru and that's still true, then please either come uh, unmute yourself and say it or post it in, in chat. But I think that it was true, I know, in, in years past. It's amazing how, how much you forget. I want to real quickly show you uh, just one item. I'm not going to show you the lab itself. I just want to show you uh, one item here. Oil. There it is. Uh, just one thing about this lab. Some Sometimes uh, in the lab itself, when you're getting used to going around this uh, different environments, there's one thing I want to warn you about. Be Try not to actually, it's okay to do actual size. But for right now, because some of my students are having problems, let's not, don't undock things, okay? Because if you undock it and then you dock it back, let's see if this will work. This one works. But if it's Cisco devices, we're having some issues. So just be aware, if you undock it and then it quits working and won't lock up, you can try to go back to docking it. Uh, if it docks back and works, fine. If, you, if it quits responding, you may want to go back and undock it again and it may work. Um, I would just say don't undock it at all. Leave them docked. That way you can just click along here and get access to all these. Okay. The other thing that's important is when you're on the Windows client, obviously you need control delete to unlock. Many people forget that you have to click right here, and that sends your control delete. So you can click right there and get access. Um, on this particular lab also, it does ask you to log in as the CyberOps user instead of the uh, administrator. So if it's set on administrator, obviously just click on CyberOps and do CyberOps, and it will log in. Okay. Um, and then the toolbox is here, and they've got all the different things here for your DNS query files. You can open it up. And then they've also got on this the um, PCAPs, and you can just double-click it and open it immediately. Okay. And again, what they have you do here is UDP filter. It's already in here, so you can actually click there and apply it and you'll see nothing but DNS traffic because UDP is in this particular PCAP. It's the only item that's in there. So uh, again, if you need to log off, just click send control delete and you can sign out. Okay, so that's one thing that confuses students sometimes. Also, like this, you'll see if, if you do see a blank screen, just click in it and hit enter. Uh, you also can say do actual size. A lot of times people like that because it's clear like here, you can see it's big. It's a little bit fuzzy, but if you make it actual size, it's a little clearer with the fonts. Okay, same thing with Security Onion. So Security Onion is just a little bit fuzzy. You can do actual size, and, and it will work. Okay, so that's available um, if you want to do that. All right, uh, let me go back to the whoop, click around there. Are there any questions before I move on? Because we're about to blow through the rest of this chapter. Pretty easy. Pretty easy chapter. Secure HTTP. Okay, so HTTPS. Okay. These are looking at different uh, server errors that are responsible. And you can look at all the connection codes here. So the code switching protocol is successful. Client request was successful. And these are all HTTP codes. Don't remember anything on that, but you know it is one of the uh, one of the things you can look at there. Web-based attacks here. You can obviously look at the OWASP. Um, there's Cisco Web Security. You can look at those items there. Uh, iframes that can be a, a big vector. Anything that's um, one thing you'll that, that's very easy to do is see iframes that lead to different sites. Okay, Ben, good question. Ben's asking, you've been completing the lab files list in Netacad using the VM machine. Are these required to complete or should we only work in the NDG lab environment? Uh, ben, it's your choice. Uh, like, uh, you are welcome to use your own local virtual machines and use the labs from in the curriculum, or you can use the NDG lab environment, or if you want to do some on your local machines and some on the NDG, um, it's up to you. What I want you to do mostly, though, is do what is going to be the way you, you actually do it in your classroom. So if you're going to be completing the labs with your students on VMs in your classroom, then, then you do the labs that way so you see any problems they may would see in your environment. If you're going to be using NetLabs, then I would actually suggest that you do the labs on NetLabs so that you get accustomed 
to uh, the net labs environment because they are slightly different than the labs in uh, that are written just for the virtual machines that you do locally. So. Okay, then Ben, it's your choice. Um, you know, um, one of the things I'm going to say, and, and what uh, what Ben said is he has access to both VMs and uh, and NetLabs. What I'm going to say is this: if you have that environment, you can do both. Um, even if you have them teach, even if you teach locally in the classroom with just your virtual machines running on VirtualBox, I would still load the the, the NetLabs so that the students at home could use it. Uh, the problem with this class uh, for students at a, in a home environment is going to be the level of PC needed to run the class. You're fine up until Chapter 10. Once you're in Chapter 11, once you're in Chapter 11, you've got to load all four machines. You're looking at needing a minimum of eight gigs of RAM to run the VMs. Um, and that's, that's a big problem for a lot of students. Um, if you've got it on your NetLab site, then they have no problems at all. They can run it. Plus, what I love about NetLabs is I can tell my students, oh, guess what? You didn't finish that lab? Well, you can do it on NetLabs tonight. You've got till tomorrow to get it done. Yeah, yeah Ben, it's, yeah. Once we get to Chapter 11, you're going to see the requirements for that local virtualized environment explodes. Um, so I would be very careful. And Robert uh, put, I had a client whose website was hacked. Every web page had an iframe added to it. I believe it. And it was probably an iframe that was maybe one dot in size that would try to redirect, and that way you couldn't even see it. Yep, it was a one dot iframe and you couldn't see it, and it would redirect to a site that tried to probably do uh, drive-by uh, malware download. Um, very common, very common thing to do. So, and a lot of that actually does rely upon some of those DNS issues. Um, you know, that they're actually moving things around using the iframes to go to a site that's been hacked that then pushes you to another site to download like an exploit kit or something of that nature. Um, we have just been getting hammered here at my school with spoofed emails that are really good spoofed emails. Um, and 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 it's it's been pretty bad. I mean, it really has. Um, I don't know exactly how they're getting it because we're running Office 365, so I don't know how it's getting into our environment. But um, it, it is something they're fighting here, and a lot of it is, of course, education. Don't click anything that doesn't look right. Don't open anything that doesn't look right. Um, but we've had some issues here locally. Um, open mail relay servers, yeah, Andrew, you're right, really bad. And it seems just like it's just uh, it's really throughout the entire, right, honestly, throughout the entire state of North Carolina Community College system. It seems like they've, they've made their way into some, some servers and, have have been able to do some things. So homoglyphs using a zero instead of a lowercase uh, uppercase letters O. Um, but yeah, it's it's been bad. It's it's been worse than, than I've seen in a while. Uh, web exposed databases. This is all kind of crazy stuff here, where you can actually go in and uh, attack a database. And if you want to go out there, you can actually find sites that will show you all the different databases that are open. Cross site scripting. Um, you know, stored, the permanently stored and effective server is received by all visitors or reflected. This is where a script is located in a link. And so cross-site scripting of this nature is really, really useful because you can have a non-persistent but reflect it to another server. And then you can down, the next time you run your malware, you can reflect it to a different server. Um, so it's pretty bad. Um, Cisco Cloud Web Security can help stop this. IPS can help stop it. Open DNS can help stop it. Uh, any type of next generation firewall that does deep packet inspection can look for credentials trying to leave your network or credentials trying to be used coming into your network. This is pretty cool. I'm not going to do this, but you can actually look at a PCAT file from attack against SQL database, which is neat. And then we're looking at server log files, which are very important. You know, you get to look at those, and it's important that you learn to read those server log files. I won't say why. But you need to know what the, the file looks like uh, for, say, a web server versus a FTP server versus other items that are in here. So you can kind of look at these syslogs and know what they are. And this is all just something to, you've been warned. So know that. And folks, that's chapter seven, which actually gets us through 
about June 15th. But I'm going to keep going, not tonight, because it's 855, but I'm going to keep going next week. I will be still here next week, uh, and hopefully you will be too as we move on to uh, assets, vulnerabilities, and threats. And then, to be quite honest with you, I am not going to lecture at all on Chapter 9, uh, the, crypto the cryptographic or cryptography chapter, um, because that's something that almost all of you know. Okay. Um, now, there's some really cool stuff in here, especially using some of the OpenSSL and doing some encrypting and decrypting, but I'm not going to actually chat, uh, lecture on that one because we'll jump forward to Chapter 10 and get us ready. Um, all the chapter exams should be on for you. You are allowed to take them up to 10 times, um, and I do not use them for actual assessment pretty much. I do. I want you to do them, but if you make a 50 one time and an 80 the next, I just take the highest. Don't worry about, you know, it's for you to learn, not for you to be uh, have an assessment so much. Uh, I've already got the final turned on. I've also got um, the all the practice exams. So there, there's a practice certification exam for 250 and 255. And there is a practice final. All those are on. Um, there are a couple of you who uh, I was not able to turn them on for um, because of you're in an existing class already. And I've contacted you or you know and you're working on those. The skills exam I will send to you as a Word document that you can then complete and you have your choice of completing it either um, locally or you have a choice of completing it on NetLabs. And I may actually have everybody do that on NetLabs just so I can, you know, I'll have uh, a, an actual record of you completing it and time spent on the labs. Are there any questions before I stop the recording? Any questions that you would, would like to uh, ask I for have, the whole time? I have one, Kelly. Um, Go ahead. In the event that and, you know, if you can't do this, I understand, but if, if we're to a point where we're done with everything else, is it possible to get the uh, skills exam sooner than, you know, oh, yeah. August? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Just, send me, just send me an email, Andrew, and I'll send it to you. All right. Appreciate it. Yep, no problem at all. I'll send, I'll send it to you. Thanks. Anybody, Thanks. Else that, anybody else that needs it, that's fine. Just send me an email, and I'll send it to you. Hi, Kelly. Um, I'm, 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 I'm behind with some of the labs, but... Um, how long do I have? You know. Um, oh yeah. Well, I'm, well, I'm, I'm actually, I'm actually at, at in money in a number of location. Which is okay. What I'm, what I'm trying to do is actually do the exams and then do the labs after. Okay, that, that's no problem. Uh, the class lasts officially until August uh, 14th. But if you have noticed, I've actually got the exams on to August 31st. So although at, on August 14th you're going to lose access to Moodle.Stanley.edu. 99% of you are not even using that because we're in Metacad. We've already done the other part. I will ask you to log in to Moodle toward the end of class just to have a quick, just quote, attendance. But um, I'm not going to turn this class off before August 31st, okay? So everybody, you know, that's that's giving you two extra weeks to complete the class. Um, okay. And so that you've got plenty of time. You know, you've got all of, I mean, it's just now, what, July 5th. So you've got uh, almost six weeks, seven weeks before. And, and in fact, even after the 14th, um, I'm going to continue to do class meetings um, just so I, I'm here on Thursday nights for everybody. Uh, when I'm at Gen Con, which is August 2nd, I believe, Thursday, August 2nd, I believe that's what that date is, I will not have a meeting that week because that's that's my full vacation week. I'm probably not even going to respond to emails, um, but I'm working by by doing things, yeah. I had to find new games for the uh, for the uh, the game club here at Stanley Community College. 